Hey everybody, welcome back to AAA Radio, where we bring our A-team of adolescents with their A-game. This is a book discussion podcast where we read cilantro books in advance and discuss what we thought of them. This week we're discussing The Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Written in 1954, Lord of the Flies is set in the middle of a nuclear war where a group of young British lads were being evacuated by plane but were shot down onto a deserted island. One of the boys, Ralph, finds a conch shell with the help of another, known only by Piggy, and uses it to gather all of the boys still alive on the island. They try to establish a miniature society with rules and responsibilities, but they lose their minds whenever anything happens, and ultimately all shirk from the responsibilities. A struggle of leadership between Ralph and Jack, another boy, ultimately causes the group to splinter. The former wants to focus on maintaining the fire to signal for rescue, while the latter wanted to hunt for meat. In the process, three of the children die, as Ralph maintains a group based on empty promises with no action, and Jack forms a belligerent tribe that loses civility and relies on strong-arming other kids into his group, and burning down the island to hunt down Ralph. Fortunately for them, they ultimately end up uh, attracting a naval officer to the island, who nonchalantly belittles the events of the island, but rescues them regardless. Now, what did you fellas think of the book? Well, the first impression I got was that um, it really called back to me, like Enlightenment, like the different philosophers of the Enlightenment, especially kind of the nuances between Hobbes and Rousseau where I feel like that was really a huge purpose from the author is trying to like draw parallels between uh, like human nature when left alone and like the philosophies by Hobbes and Rousseau. And the, the impression specifically that I got is that the author actually agreed way more with Hobbes than Rousseau that humans are naturally violent and they need a strong ruler to uh, control them. Yeah, I did feel like that idea of um, what what is human nature? Is it good or is it bad does come through? But then at the same time, it's like a, I felt that it was a warped version of Hobbes' uh, philosophies because Hobbes believed that uh, humans are inherently evil, right? And then the only yeah. way to control them is uh, systems of law. law. But then uh, Golding kind of t- took it one step further, as in like, because... Because Ralph tried to set up a society based on rules and laws to some extent, but then he didn't really have the authority. He didn't. He wasn't given the authority to do so, and that led to that violent human nature erupting regardless. Well, what I got the impression that I got from Ralph was it was more he wanted to build like a, I don't know, like a more democratic society rather than. Like just uh, like a dictatorship, right? So yes, I feel I feel like Ralph wasn't actually like trying to be like a strong leader, that like in in the Hobbesian style. Yeah, that seems that seems about right because um because Hobbes did believe in like a divine right of kings, and the only character in the book that comes close to this idea of a divine right to a rule would be Jack, who who's ultimately subscribes to savage ideals anyway. So it's like that authority that he that Hobbes believed in was used for the completely wrong purpose. Ralph, in lacking that, uh, essentially was not really Hobbes' idea of a leader, in a sense, I guess. So wait, do you think that the author was trying to criticize Hobbes in at least some way in in that because Jack maybe was a bad leader or something? Yes, to to an extent, yeah, because um, that sense of rules and laws and the goodness of society, it relies on the assumption that if a leader comes in place, the leader will obey that social contract to make rules and laws that will bring security everyone to everyone. Whereas Jack doesn't really do that, despite despite essentially being Hobbes' idea of a king. He establishes like a rule of law that's even worse than the system that was put in place before 
of the uh, everyone losing civility and human nature being bad. Hmm. I mean, I, I suppose in that sense, the author kind of shows how arbitrary the rules of law society is. It's like everyone kind of sucks. And people want to resort to horrible things anyways if there's no proper regulation. So it's one of the takeaways is children are horrible. Yep. I did I did actually I, I thought his I, his choice to use children in the story instead of like adults or even teenagers was actually pretty brilliant. Because uh you know children children typically are are figured to be the basal essence of humanity despite what people what philosophers in uh the 1800s might have thought. It's like children nowadays are considered to be basically humans in the most unadulterated form, and now that's normally thought of as pure, but like if you if you see middle schoolers, like even when we were middle schoolers, that was probably not the case. I think it's like you could say that civil, like the ideals of civilization, haven't really been fully implemented on them yet, right? So they haven't fully learned their manners or what's acceptable behavior or whatnot. So it's more, it's a better hu- exploration of human nature than perhaps if adults with per- already previously established social norms had landed on that island. Yeah, that is true. But in that sense, it also still creates this idea of the weakness of law and then sort of, I guess, appreciates how difficult it is to establish a society. Because um, ultimately what did save them was be, was it was in essence foreign intervention. They were saved by foreign intervention because it was the naval officer who followed a code of law that was very different to what was on the island that ultimately came and saved them all. And then they were trying to build a society based around the absence of adults, as in trying to come up with what they thought adults would, what policies they thought adults would have. And then because they didn't really have an idea of those rules and laws. They just kind of went al- went along with whatever they thought would be the case, but then it didn't end up working. So, do you think that, uh, like, the outside world is better, perhaps, than the the island? Like, I mean, the real world was like had a better civilization than the island, because the kind of the sense that I got was that even though they were technically rescued. It was like in the middle of some war, right? And it, it was almost as if it wasn't any better than what they already had on the island. Yeah, honestly, honestly, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that uh, the outside world, even in even in his book, was necessarily better than this than what was happening on the island. Uh, it's more of a sense of um, them being rescued from immediate danger to. A danger that is like only ninety five percent likely to kill them rather than a hundred percent likely to kill them, so it's not really mm-hmm. sense of them escaping into a better society, but more of um them their imminent collapse being delayed slightly yeah, I'd agree with you on that hmm. And then at the same time, at the same time, because um, I think it's reasonably assumable that Hobbes's not Hobbes, sorry, Golding's uh, purpose in the book was to base was in essence to mock civilization, more both mock civilization and human nature, because like human nature is shown to be bad, but he's also showing the weakness of civilization in dealing with that. Because, like, despite them trying to come up with rules and laws, without definitive punitive punishments, like, because I think the only time in the book that anything happened was when they were under threat from an outside force. Uh, right. Without definitive punitive threats and punishments, even their civilization didn't really achieve anything. Do you, th- do you guys right. think that uh, says anything about regular society, then? I mean, I I don't know if that's like a. I feel like some pressure needs to be applied for progress to be made, right? Like uh, we probably wouldn't if I don't know how to say this, but like uh, 
most of our achievements have just been in response to threats, like even in just not even in the book, but just in like regular human civilization, like fire is was a response to like both disease and also predators. And then um, like basically everything I think has tried to be a, a response to a threat of some sort. So I, so I guess I kind of see what you're saying. But um, I think that's just most of innovation comes from that rather than something proactive. It's like, I think almost the vast majority of innovation throughout history has been uh, something reactive, like uh, in response to something rather than, oh, this is cool, but we, we don't know what it's for. But it's just a cool thing that we'll do. So you would uh, so you'd agree with the ideas that Golding puts forward about how civilization works in his book, then? Yeah, I'd say so, but I don't know. I don't. I don't know if it would be like a mocking tone, more just like. I don't know. I didn't get. I didn't. Sorry. No, I, I figured it was kind of more like a sad ode to what human nature is and an inability to change it. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, I kind of got that sense more than like mocking. Yep. What I I don't know what I was thinking about was what if like I, I just wanted to get like pick your brains on this. What do you think would have happened if instead of all boys, like it was all girls that landed on the island? Frankly, I would figure that it would ultimately end up the same. Well, not the same in the exact same way, but because it's it's the nineteen. 19- what is it? The 1940s, right? That's when this book takes place? I think so, yeah. Okay, it's the 1940s then. Even then there was still, at that time, there was still prescribed gender ideals in a sense through the ideas of like the, like the, the idea of the perfect nuclear family. So it wouldn't have been exactly the same, but essentially I figure that in Golding's version of the book, it would have ultimately ended up in a very similar situation. So you don't think it's just because of like natural like heightened male aggression and stuff that uh, I don't th- think that's, that's what I don't think that was what I don't I don't think that would have affected it mostly because of the message that Golding is trying to convey. I feel like the message is Golding is trying to convey is more of a sense of like actual overall human nature and then even if it was all girls he probably would have found a way to have it still be the same conclusion yeah i can see that i feel like yeah if it was a mono gender it wouldn't have changed all that much because in the end people still suck regardless of whatever biological minor change there would have been i mean i i suppose it probably would have been marginally less horrible because combination of what they were taught in school, I suppose. Yep. It's like aggression is less encouraged. I mean, the choice of boys, from what I can tell, is mostly to, it's like sort of a satire. It's attacking a popular genre of adventure books where a bunch of kids find a magic island and have fun. And, and the author said, no, this is, this is that, that, that's not how things would work. Oh, so you, you think it's a rip on Ended But Lighten? Doesn't the officer, like, directly flame Crystal Island or something, literally near the end? Yeah. Honestly, he does. It is kind of... I, I see your point. It's kind of a flame on an Biden. Um, I would agree that the... That if it were an all-female group on the island, it would have ended up the same, much like you said, how the author wasn't trying to target a specific gender or age. He was just specifically using the group of boys to make an overall statement. Uh, Throughout the book, I didn't really focus on like what the author was stating about human nature, really. I think I was more focused on long-term versus short-term motivation in humans. And I feel like um, Jack was more for the short-term motivations of food. Well, um, his name has ultimately slipped from my mind. Ralph uh, was more for the 
long-term motivation of actually getting rescued off of the island. That is true. What did you feel was the like the purpose of that comparison between long-term and short-term motivations? Like, what was the message? Did you figure? Was there a message? Um, I think there was a message. I mean, ultimately, in the end, abandons the fire, and he too is focused on the short-term motivations of simply not getting slaughtered by Jack, and. I think that says a lot about human nature on in a society, how we will focus on the long-term motivations. But I think once we don't have that secured future, we start diving down into focusing on the short term and what's going to happen tomorrow rather than in four weeks. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective because I think you can – Kind of t- tie it back to that like central theme of like civilization versus savagery. Savagery, like ba- basically most animals are focused on the short term. Just you have to find shelter, you have to find food to eat, you have to find water to drink, and then only when you have all of those short term needs secured can you actually focus on the long term. And perhaps that's like what civilization is: is just mo- a heightened focus on the long term needs of a species or a group of people or whatever yeah definitely that kind of ties into like a hierarchy of needs how you must have the basic needs met before you can focus on something long term there's also the um, things that are eminently graspable it's like there's not much certainty that but will ever come and pick them up well there is a pig and you can stab it and uh, now that I think about it, I feel like the specific demographic is pretty important to the book. I think older adults or adolescents likely would have had far less problematics because easier organization, hunting, and other such skills, along with adults, would have far greater hunting and organization skills. With the How old were the children in the book? It's kind of not super specific. Um, they were roughly between the ages. I think the youngest was about five, and then the oldest was the oldest two were twelve. I also feel like the gender aspect wouldn't have changed because the age, like ultimately, would end up. I feel like the progression would have been less severe and slightly slower because of like the gender ideals of the day, and also I feel like. The author kind of wants to take a jab idea of the perfect British young man. Like, it is both like a point in that time of history and still kind of to the day the European young boy is sort of seen as like, hey, look, pretty cool guy. I feel like savage reversalization is also sort of an arbitrary term as well. Civilization A versus civilization B. I mean, if they just all go on with Jack's idea, they probably would have been semi-functional for a decently long time. Oh, no, sorry. I didn't, like, mean as in, like, one of the organizations was civilization, one of them was Sadri. I was more saying, like, an organ, the organization of people and, like, the the functioning of, like, a at a higher level than just just trying to survive, I think, is more of a definition of civilization. I wasn't trying to, like, say... That Jack, Jack's, whatever, Jack's like organization was savage while Ralph's was civilized or something. That's not what I meant. Sorry for the misconception there, misunderstanding. No, I actually, like that, that is kind of how the book presents it, which is a little odd. Also, I feel like eminent survival is the goal of both, just seen in a very different way. How, how so? Could you expand on that? The boys, uh, Ralph and pals, think they're going to die if they don't get rescued. And Jack and pals think they're going to die if they don't eat meat. It's the difference between really, really eminent and long-term eminent. But in both ways, it's survival. It's not a long time to go that way. Just starting a fire... Well, I suppose it's just one of them prefers being on the island, the other one does not. They're both decently concerned with survival, but it's not hard for 
that's not an issue for either of them, right? There's abundant amounts of fruit trees and there's a lot of food stuff. And even though you could argue that Ralph is thinking of head, it's not really put that way. Like he does not mention things like winter or random disasters on the island that would decline the food population. It's more of the comforts of civilized society and the frightening reveals of the other children around him. Yeah, he, he I, I was kind of frustrated that he did not at even at one one point say that winter is coming and we need to stock up on food and rations. I, I think that's intentional because like the children aren't thinking of long term issues. That's not the focus the author wanted to put, although it is a conclusion that can be drawn from it. Like they're on a temperate island with abundant food sources, seemingly lack of venomous and poisonous entity, seeming lack of predators with a large quantity of pigs being the only notable large animal. And th there's also the point of the beasts. Like, there's an imaginary threat, because this is a pretty peaceful place otherwise. I kind of feel like that does ascertain some... Well, not some, actually a great deal of relevance to, like, today's society, in a sense, because it's like... And how not just today's society, but, like just in the idea of how society has been run over the past over the past several centuries even millennia it's like it's it seems like with most civilization with most civilizations with most eras of human history we've needed this sense of an external threat to maintain peace within right like uh i don't know say during say during um the more profound examples would probably be during, say, World War One and World War Two. Oh, hey, uh, you need to keep electing me into power. I need to. We need to stay in power. You need to. We all need to unite so that we don't literally die at the hands of this overpowering and yet at the same time very weak external threat. Then that even happens during times of peacetime. It's like, uh, say during, say during the Roaring Twenties. Say during the Roaring Twenties. Uh, the only reason they were able to stay that prosperous is because they prided themselves on their prosperity and then disparaged other countries as being as trying to steal their prosperity in many places. And that's kind of how even, I guess, I'm not trying to get overtly political here, but just in a general statement, that's also kind of how elections are run today in democratic countries because it's like you want to get elected to avoid this external threat, and that seems to be the most effective argument in getting people to vote for you. I feel the word needing is already weird, because it's it's not. People don't need an external threat. We have never had to. Like You're perfectly functional without it, as demonstrated by the side of Ralph. But it's rather people want to have a group identity, and the simplest way to do so is to create a arbitrary external enemy to contrast themselves to even in completely imaginary one like the beast sorry so you're saying that people collectively form an external threat because they want group a, like a group to to be formed from that partially and there's also the idea there's it's a really easy way to form a group like as a leader figure if you have a arbitrary enemy for your people to unite against, then there is a definition of your people. Like, if there is no contrast, there is no group. There's just a blob of human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, like the rise in nationalism in the late 1800s. That was like one of the big things: is we we're a people, we're a nationality, and everyone, and so it's us versus them, and so that's how like countries unified a lot around was the, this idea of nationalism so that all your that this kind of reminds me a lot about nationalism is Hell that is us versus them mentality there's a rise in nationalism today with the growing extremist groups everyone's in the us versus them mentality because as the world becomes blurry they cling desperately to whatever they have it's kind of why conspiracy theories spread so well. It's like the same reason why people like unpopular groups of music or books or games. Because it makes them feel special or important or different than everyone else. Although, I suppose in Flat Earth and anti vax you're doing quite more harm than want liking, um, I don't know, Superman 64. 
that's a good example. But honestly, yeah, with all the examples we've given and the fact that it's people cling so desperately to that ideal of us versus them, that tribalistic men's mindset that enables progress, I would still argue that it's more of a sense of need for civilization. Like, it's not really a want for civilization, it's like a need for civilization. Because, like, the book clearly shows that Ralph's group, Ralph groups, without women, they didn't have an external threat that was, like, that was an immediate threat, rather than just the arbitrary idea of, oh, if we, we need to get rescued, because if we don't get rescued, we'll die. Because that's not really quantifiable as an enemy. And because they lacked that, didn't the society basically never really function? Like, at the very first moment, despite them trying to, or while they were still trying to organize what was, in effect, a constitution for them, they basically all just ran off at the first mention of a slightly exciting idea, and then ended up killing a little child, a youngling. And then when they were trying to build the shelters, only really two or three people were building them because the other ones didn't really feel the pressure or the need for shelter. Then when the rains came, they basically just blamed Ralph for not building a good shelter for them. So again, it's still, I feel like it's still a matter of like human civilization needs an external threat in order to keep that mindset, keep that sense of unity. Like, do you, um, do you guys get my point there? Because it's like, even if we ultimately fully end up globalizing, we'd probably need like an external threat. Like, oh, the aliens are coming in order to keep the progress <laughs> going. I would say that's, that's, no, we don't need an external threat. It's just someone's going to make them seize power. You can function fairly well without necessarily external fight. Like I, I would argue, Ralph's group did not necessarily have an external enemy, and there's certain beliefs that make you not see an external enemy as much as others. But didn't they like not function that well? Because if they had functioned well, they would have been able to, you know, keep the whole team on board rather than Jack, who's in effect a dissuadent, seizing power because of the lack of an enemy. Just because one thing is more effective in Granny Group does not mean the other thing is not effective. Ralph was fairly functional until they had, you know, the incentive of meat. Let's say the island had no pigs whatsoever. There's no real reason why Jack would ever be betrayed. Because in the thrill of the hunt and savagery, and whatever move him would not have led him to create a group. Like, if it was just a peaceful island with a lot of fruit trees, they probably would have just kept creating the fire. That is true, but, like, even when Jack wasn't, uh, like, obs that obsessed with the thrill of the hunt yet, and he wasn't actively trying to ruin society, wasn't it basically just Ralph, Piggy, and Simon that were working, and then everyone else was lounging around not doing anything? Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not really that effective of a society, because it's like, not everyone is contributing equally, and if we put a society as everyone understands their place, and everyone does everyone acts like the cogs to maintain the society that is needed. Ralph's group still wasn't that functional. It just didn't it just didn't explode because there was like a deserting force. But they were still I not the optimal. The problem with that is that um they're literal children, I suppose. I think that's why cuz like if you put any group that's somewhat older but not significantly deviated individual, there's a good chance a fire would have been noted out of importance and kept going. I feel that's where the child aspect really comes to play because it's difficult for them to grasp the concepts of object permanence sometimes. And also the secondary action of that was especially important during the beginning where no one knew what they were doing anyways. And besides, it's a group of uneducated younglings on a very rich resource, exceedingly beautiful and full of warm water location. It's uh, not easy to incentivize them unless there's a blatant and obvious reward, which the hunting side did. And the hunting side never needed an external enemy, it just needed to hunt. Like, they could have functioned fairy fell uh, well without a beast, but rather just the reward of cooked meat itself. That is true, but then it's like the choice, the choice of golding to use those kids, those uneducated kids is probably intentional because why would he have chosen them if they were unless he was trying to create a book that had no consequence 
Because I feel like that was basically just like, not really in euphemism, but like more of a hyperbole of actual society. Because it's like, in a sense, we are all kind of slightly that sense of that uneducated population. It's like, that's everyone, not just like a special group of people. Because it's like, at this point, we have all specialized, or the, the society that we've made all requires specialization. So it's like in most aspects, really in most aspects, we're uneducated. We're just educated in a very small aspect. Kind of like how Jack was considered the specialist on hunting. And so everyone followed his trust, followed him because he was a specialist. And then Ralph was a specialist on fire, but then he stopped being the specialist on fire. So they just kind of left him. Do you guys make any comparisons in the book between, like, the democratic process and the idea of the military insurrection? Because that was going on a lot at the time that the book was written. I would say, in a way, he kind of shows how arbitrary and horrible all of it is. And ironically shows there's not too much of a difference in the end, because I feel like there is a reason why the first thing they greeted is a military helicopter when they rescued with machine guns and armed soldiers. A supposed democracy that is totally not under military control in any way, shape, or form. Hmm. At true. the same time, that kind of argues for balance. You kind of need both. You need some forceful way of enforcing it, but without the um, input of the people or decision-making process, you just end up having a horribly violent group. Um, I was thinking that the more military style group of jacks although it was more restrictive it was very organized compared to the democratic group that ralph offered because when ralph was leading a lot of people were just slacking off or they didn't know what to do and they would spend most of their time playing near the water while in jack's group it was very organized he had people guarding the cave and whatnot or like they did what they he asked him to, and I feel like it reflects the immediate threat that everyone can see versus the long-term threat that only a few people can see. So that kind of explains how only a few people in Ralph's group really acted. So in essence, the failure of the democratic group was that their they're like once the the ultimate goal they they had was like very arbitrary and then therefore not uh you you couldn't really see active change i guess active progress towards that goal is that what you're saying yeah that's what i'm really saying because i feel like a lot of people didn't see hope with the fire and what it could bring so that's why not a lot of people were invested Yes, that's what I'm saying. Honestly, I feel like that is pretty, like, I feel like that can, I'm using the word ascertain a lot, it's a cheese. Um, I feel like that could ascertain to the reality of the situation that was going on at the time, because it was like the height of the Cold War, right? So then even in real life, it was this idea of, like, oh, the democratic West that spoke of ideals and where's, the people who want, who in effect subscribe to that dictatorial Stalinism or dictatorial communism wanted food, bread, and shelter, like the basic necessities, which Jack in the book is fighting for. So it's like, because they put those basic necessities first rather than grandiose ideas of oh, goodness or what is the right way of life, uh, the authoritarian groups ended up seizing power despite despite technically being the worst group of the two in terms of morality. I mean, I suppose there's the simple reason of that people need to, you know, not die. Corpses can't make morality decisions. Yeah, exactly, because um, that's how most that's how the most notable insurrections occur, right? Because it's like the idealistic power wasn't providing them what they needed to survive, so they you couldn't really snack 
you, you can't really have an afternoon tea and crumpets based on oh de- democracy and freedom of speech like a cup of a cup of freedom with a crumpet of a side of political rights also i noticed in the book that there's like a particular focus on the conch as a sim as a symbol what do you guys feel that the conch represents uh, society order there's a lot of things but it's like organization and arbitrary power i suppose why would you call it arbitrary the conch does not give you any power but because they decided on pawn it it does and the ironic thing is that it, it does have legitimate power up until the point people decide it doesn't. And then it stops. I that's fair, I guess. Yeah. Was there anything else do you guys reckon? Or was that the only purpose of the conch? It, it also is a literal organizational item because it can make loud noisy and get everyone to place. <laughs> yes. We humans are partial to that, aren't we? All the ooga booga. That's what we like. Ooga booga caveman brain. Loud noise does not mean authoritative. The loudest one is automatically the leader. Okay, uh, we we honestly kind of didn't go too deep. Like, we related it to today's society somewhat. But do you guys figure that there's any other relevance of the book to today's society? Like, would you recommend that as a must-read for everyone in the sense of learning about the perils of society in a sense. I feel like it's a very interesting read and I definitely would recommend it. I don't think it's particularly necessary to function or to achieve a light enlightenment in society, but I think it gives a very interesting take on human nature and the society we live in. I suppose it's not a, bad book at all like the prose is surprisingly enjoyable and the characters feel decently well written like none of them feel horribly static or unrealistic idealistic and dialogues relatively naturalistic um what it says about society is a bit i feel like it's kind of slightly dated with the demographic and also there's an odd focus on the hair growing longer and skin getting darker as they progress along with slightly rude wording which makes it like the savagery it's kind of lowers the nuance slightly but otherwise it's an interesting read i think what's important to keep in mind reading is like are the adults doing really anything better than this i suppose it's like an idea they should keep in mind when reading it if you explore that side of things and i think it's definitely worth reading and important to read but if you just want to look for human nature, it's not particularly insightful. Like, people suck. Yes, the historical context is to mock groups of adventure books where young kids go on islands and just act really nice all the time. Re- Remove from the context, and it's not as strong. That is true what you guys uh, said about the human nature aspect of it, but honestly, I'm, su- honestly, I'm kind of su- surprised. Um, I, I kind of felt that it was... In terms of a pure warning about what can happen if a society doesn't function right and if people aren't aware of the potential, the always constant potential of the failure of society, it, I feel like that's, it's a very important book in that sense of uh, informing people about what can happen. Because it's like ultimately it's that education of what can happen and then being able to self-reflect and understand whether that applies to yourself and the, the people, the society that you live in. I feel like that that's an important take from this book. Because it's like, if you know what can cause a society to fail and what people ultimately want from a society, like even whether consciously or unconsciously, we can in a sense work to build a better society objectively because it's like, of, well, not a better necessarily, but like a more functional one, and then that would kind of help us from the help us move away from the tribalistic mindset that the book details. Because honestly, today, even today, we're kind of tribalistic on pretty much everything, like you've mentioned. All right, that has been it.
Uh, that has been it for The Lord of the Flies by William Golding this week. Um, what would you guys rate this book out of 10? I would give it a solid 8. Because I genuinely like the narration. I would also say around an 8. It's well written. Although Simon feels a little odd of a character. The entire Lord of the Flies is slightly misleading. Because it's very, very... Uh, something that did not need to be explained. Right? So Lord of the Flies goes, I was inside of you the whole time. And Simon's like, oh, doesn't the rest of the story show that already? And then Laura Fly says, oh, uh, bye. That's right. I'll give it an 8.5 because I I like the I like the the sense of informing people about tribalistic mindsets that the book kind of does throughout the whole book. And as for the Simon thing, I think that was more of just as a fail safe, just in case people didn't get the overall nuance. Hmm. Yes, so that has been it for this book. Uh, We hope you enjoyed. Have a good day. Goodbye.